life-changing decisions and have had several personal rituals both alone and with others and this year I was blessed to do a recommitment ceremony for a couple who just happened to ask me to do the ceremony at Halibut Point which is this amazing coincidence because it's such a sacred place to me and so it was just the three of us and the photographer standing in the rain for an hour and a half <laughs> but it was phenomenal and this was a recommitment ceremony because they had experienced in their first five years of marriage a tremendous amount of grief due to um, death and depression and job loss and they wanted to start anew so it rained throughout the entire ceremony and as we were setting up so that's the hour and a half and then as we were finished the sun came out and that's the miracle of nature Discovering awesome beauty can happen anytime while you're walking in the neighborhood right in the middle of New York City and coming upon the bare autumn beach birch poised against the vast blue sky. John Muir once said, everyone needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play and pray where nature heals and gives us strength to body and soul alike. And the natural world can provide us with moments of majesty, like this one. I don't know if you can see it, but this mirror image uh, is of Mount Hood, um, the mountain and the reflection, which our celebrants from the Northwest may recognize. And it was taken while on a camping trip where I officiated a small, intimate family wedding for my very own mother. And they chose to have the wedding um, on Mount Hood because when my mom was a little girl, she could see Mount Hood out her bedroom window. And it was always a very special place to her. And then she grew up and lived in the Midwest and decided to move back to the Northwest and have her wedding on that mountain that she could see out her bedroom window. So the next time you are in a place in nature where you feel connected, alive, inspired, or at peace, notice how you feel in your body. Open up all of your senses and notice something that really catches your attention and evokes in you that sense of awe and wonder. And then consider writing about your experience and see what comes out because it may be a wonderful source of inspiration for a ceremony. Deeper connection with self sometimes comes in gathering with others, like today, where we can see the hidden parts of ourselves mirrored back to us. Many of our celebrants shared how important their animal companions are to them, and how spending time with them is so nurturing, like that beautiful story that Tony shared with us. Here we have Risa, the gray cat, Oscar, the orange, and Ipaw, I, little I, big P, <laughs> Ipaw, <laughs> the tabby. And these are Karen Swirsky's cats, who accompanied her through this program by sitting on her lap as she connected with us online from Bend, Oregon. And we're thinking of Karen today. And here is our new colleague, Mary Driscoll, resting after taking her favorite hike to this rock at Priest Lake, Idaho, with her beloved Mary Posa and Kel Sapel. And Mary understands the importance of our connections with our, with our pets, our beloved pets, so she has decided that one of the things that she will be specializing in as a funeral celebrant is pet memorials. And that is Raphael. Many of us find sustenance in connecting with family members by phone or in person, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, doing simple but important things, like having dinner together, sharing stories, laughing, and goofing around. That's important too. That's my family right there. <laughs> Todd and Elijah or just being quiet together. 
This is an aspect of self-care that I am particularly interested in, that fine balance between time spent working and time spent with your family. And this, I have to say, is probably one of the motivators that launched me into this endeavor is, how do I do this? How, how do I do this? <laughs> How? <laughs> Haven't figured it out yet, <laughs> but I'm striving, striving. So, of course, this can be particularly challenging when you have young children, but one seasoned celebrant told me that it's challenging if you, even if you're the aunt or the uncle, then you want to spend time with your nieces and nephews or your grandchildren and attend weekend family events. And, of course, weekends are when ceremonies are taking place. So. It's, it's a balance to kind of discern in yourself how much is too much and where is that line. And like I said, this is Raphael with his love Gina and his star child Emily. And Raphael um, would have come a day earlier, but Emily won a national award. She created a video that won a national award. So she was receiving her award yesterday. And so they flew out immediately after um, Emily won her video award. <laughs> She's nine. She's nine, yeah. And Corrine reminds us of the importance of connecting with our loved ones who have passed as well. She shared that one of her family sustenance rituals is lighting a candle for her father at Christmas time and other family gatherings. Throughout my years as a faculty member of the Celebrant Foundation, I have been struck by the wisdom and depth of sharing that goes on here. Did anyone else notice that? <laughs> I'm aware of how we impact each other in profound ways just by sharing ourselves. This community is such an important part of our work. One of my students, Molly Malay, from none other than Paradise, California, is also a holistic nurse. And the emphasis of her work is teaching others to take care of themselves more effectively and fully. She beautifully describes why sustenance rituals are essential to our work as celebrants because they help us develop our individual beliefs and our interior compass. I quote Molly who says, through these rituals of self-care, we become more available to clients, able to listen compassionately, without judgment, available, open, and clear. Molly shared this phenomenal quote by the author Thomas More. Take note of this quote. <laughs> Yes, I will. <laughs> so Thomas More says that our culture needs the specialist who has no need to defend his or her own beliefs, but who can speak intelligently and reflectively on how to live ritually, how to deal with death, and how to find deeply rooted attitudes toward marriage, illness, work, and community. Molly believes that by engaging in sustenance, sustenance rituals, we are able to become and remain that specialist who is sure of their own center, unafraid and unthreatened to hear and witness the dreams and beliefs of others. Self-care is critical for anyone in the caregiving professions, including celebrants. How many of you are have already been in the caregiving professions. Many. So you know. For some of us, self-care is about time management. I will admit to you that that is my issue. <laughs> you may have noticed that earlier today. For some, it is personal and energetic boundaries. For some, it is about financial well-being. And that's where that how much is too much question comes in and then relates to what Kim was sharing with us about valuing ourselves. And for others, it is learning to create daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal self-care and sustenance rituals for ourselves, and it is a rich area of exploration. 
Susan Winnicky, our new colleague from River Hills, Wisconsin, shared that she believes that in order to be able to speak the language of a celebrant and the language of celebrancy to others, we actually have to know the language in ourselves and be familiar and comfortable with the terrain of ceremony and ritual in our own lives. We must both talk and walk the path that we are inviting others to walk with us. And Judy Govey, who is also a licensed counselor, states that maintenance of our own inner condition is our primary responsibility, as we can only give what we have. In my course on care and sustenance of the celebrant, which I will be offering this fall, we'll go into further depth about various specific aspects of self-care and explore ways to stay fully engaged in our work and endeavor to better understand, prevent, and address burnout. I want to acknowledge that this work comes with unique challenges, which like any other worthwhile endeavor will draw up and out the absolute best in you, like drawing water from that deep and mysterious well. In our work, we encounter people in times of transition, which is an emotionally charged and vulnerable time for anyone. Our clients may share with us personal issues, family dynamics, painful stories. And the question is, how does that impact us personally? It is of the utmost importance to cultivate self-knowledge, self to better understand our own triggers, our own limits, boundaries, and our roles in these encounters. This requires diligent self-care. In the fall course, we're going to be able to talk in more depth and on a personal basis about these practices and struggles, but I want to give you a tiny little taste of it right now by asking you to turn to the person next to you and partner up. So I think it's best if you actually turn your chairs to face each other. It's sharing time. So decide who's going to go first. And if you need to, you can be a trio, but if, you're a, if you don't have a partner, raise your hand. Here's one. Anybody else? There's one over there. Okay. So you're going to decide who's going to go first. Here's a partner, partner alert. And I'm going to have you take two minutes each. So just pause for a moment before we begin. And I'm going to ask you to decide who's going first. And that first person has two minutes. And I'm going to ask you to share something that you struggle with in terms of self-care or a current challenge that you face that makes it hard to take care of yourself. And then I also want you to share a current self-practice, a self-care practice that you already do and a self-care practice or ritual that you would like to cultivate as you leave through the door today. Yep. So, all in two minutes, so you can tell you're just kind of scratching the surface. You're going to share a self-care struggle or a current challenge that makes it hard for you to take care of yourself. You're going to share a self-care practice that you already do. And you're going to share a self-care practice that you'd like to cultivate. And then I'll ring the bell at two minutes. And when I ring that, you're going to switch. And the role of the partner is witness. You don't have to say anything. You're just going to listen and make eye contact and witness and then say thank you. You don't have to say anything. OK. So begin. Like I said, it's been wonderful for me to hear and learn about the great variety of self-care self and sustenance practices that are available to us. And maybe you just got a little sampling of that. Did anybody hear something that was new to them or that they thought was interesting or they might want to try? Okay. So in um, thinking about this, I kind of realized that there's all these different kinds of um, self-care and sustenance rituals. There are daily, 
weekly, monthly, seasonal, yearly. Um, there are cleansing and clearing rituals. There are connecting and centering rituals. There are gratitude rituals. There are rituals for making affirmations and intention setting and healing rituals. And I'm sure that doesn't cover everything, but it felt like that kind of covered most of what I was hearing. So I want to share with you some examples of some of the things that were shared with me in each of these realms. So each of these things begins, just as we began today, by creating intentional space and time to do them. And that's all it takes for it to be a sustenance ritual, is to make intentional space and time to do even the simplest activity. And some celebrants find this place of personal sanctuary in the natural world, as we've talked about. And this magnificent view is the view from the front porch of Carolyn Flanders' home in Duluth, California. And Carolyn could not be here with us today, which she planned to be, because she is a new grandma. She became a grandma on Wednesday, so let's send some love out to baby Ava Lynn, who was born on Wednesday. And this is the gorgeous retreat of Tomas in uh, Agua Blanca, Mexico. And Tomas is my student and one of our new fellow celebrants. And he described this as a sanctuary, not only for himself, but for his family and for all of their guests who come to this retreat. And it's a beautiful setting where he's um, plan now planning to offer ceremonies, which will be amazing. And he has made a new commitment to himself, which is to walk these beautiful grounds daily with the intention to ground himself and awaken to his own beautiful inner landscape. And this is Karen Swirsky's garden, and it's her favorite outdoor place for reflections. And this is Mary Driscoll's urban garden, which is a counterpoint to her uh, rural lakeside gardens um, in, at pre her lake house in Idaho. And Mary is particularly interested, along with pet memorials, also in helping families to create memorial gardens, which is something that she did for her own family and her own parents. And Mary says that gardening is her sustenance ritual. She spends an hour or more in the dirt and the sun and the breeze and calls it reverie. And she repeats this several times during a week or every day in a good season, and it is a very much missed ritual during the snow-covered winter. So I would like to invite Mary to join me now and share a poem by Mary de la Valette. I do not have to go to sacred places in far-off lands. The ground I stand on is holy. Here in this little garden I tend, my pilgrim ends. The wild honeybees, the hummingbird moths, the flickering firelights at dusk are a microcosm of the universe. Each seed that grows, each spade of soil is full of miracles. And I toil and sweat, and I watch and wonder, and am full of love. Living in place, in this place, for truth and beauty dwell here. Thank you, Mary. And some of us create our own unique altars indoors, and this is Sian's beautiful altar in her yoga and meditation room. And this is Judy's uh, kitchen windowsill altar, which she calls her props and reminders. And there are also simple ways that we can create a reflective space for ourselves. 
simply by lighting a candle, and this candle belongs to Kareen. And even more mundane and yet spectacular is this kitchen altar, which is a tribute to the mother of Michelle Rose, our new client who lives in a suburb of Chicago. And she shared with us that she inherited her mother's cookbooks and recipes, as well as her love and passion for cooking and baking and entertaining. So her personal sustenance ritual in her altar is her kitchen. Each year I ask my students to share what sustenance rituals they're currently doing, and the responses are amazingly varied and rich. And there are many common denominators, simple things like a mindful morning cup of tea, journaling, yoga, meditation, walking in a beautiful setting, smudging. Daily rituals can be very simple. They are the mindful things we do each day. And so in response to that part of you that says, I'm too busy and I don't have time, I don't have time either. <laughs> I just got my five minute warning. Um, I encourage you to observe the rhythms of your day and build in little subtly nurturing activities throughout. For example, our new celebrant, Patty Clark, starts off each morning with a gong on her singing bowl. And she says that gong creates for her the intent to have a fabulous day. And there are mealtime rituals and this beautiful prayer wheel, um, Tibetan prayer wheel belongs to Molly Malay and it was given to her by her dear Tibetan friend. And it's something that she and her husband use at their own meals um, to magnify and multiply their own prayers and intentions to send them out to the universe and also as a mindfulness focus to open their hearts and generate compassion. And our dear Sasha Jones, who lives right here in New York City via Wales, goes on gratitude strolls, carrying these beautiful heart-shaped stones in her hand and being mindful of what she's grateful for that day in her life. And Carol Davidson shared, I don't know if you can see that, but it's the Northern Lights. She shared that um, Carol lives in Spirit River, Alberta, Canada, where she can see those Northern Lights. So she shared that one of the last things she does at night is go out and enjoy the nighttime sky. She looks for the Northern Lights, and she finds that this calms her down and prepares her for sleep. Weekly and monthly rituals may include worship services, meditation groups, meetings, full moon and new moon rituals, women's or men's groups, wet lodges, healing circles, so many amazing things that were shared. And I want to share something very simple that you can do at your very own desk. So I'm going to skip all kinds of gorgeous photos. Here, I'll show you really quick. <laughs> Fall. Winter, spring, <laughs> summer, May Day, which is today, <laughs> summer solstice. Can you see that exquisite piece of art that was created by my friend for a summer solstice ritual? Thanksgiving, where our own um, family tables become an altar. And of course, the winter festivals, which welcome the return of the light. And I wanted you to think about consciously creating your workspace so that even your work, even you can even build in these sustenance rituals right into your work. Like, that is right above my computer. So all I have to do is just look up and remember to breathe. And then I have another one also right there at eye level that says entering into the mystery. So those are a, a few little things that I do. And this gorgeous Kuan Yin is, um, belongs, lives in the home of Susan Winnicky. And these, uh, this amazing black stone belongs to Corrine again. And this stone used to sit on her father's desk. And now it sits on her desk. And it connects her to him. So very, very quickly, I'm going to ask Cindy and 
Sasha to come up here. And I'm going to show you a few little things that you can do at your own desk. Really simple. And then you should have received a handout. Maybe you received two. Um, one is yoga minis. And the other is a description of my fall course. And I want to show you how extremely simple yoga can be. And the, this mini series was developed by my friend Nadia Putini, who's a yoga teacher. And she developed four yoga series for us. And I'm going to offer these in the fall course. But this is the desk series. So I want you all to do this along with Cindy and Sasha. So plant yourself in your seat. If it's easier, you can sit on the edge of your chair so your feet can be firmly planted. And all you have to do is just take a deep breath and raise your shoulders up to your ears. Hold it. And then exhale and let them drop. And let's just do that two more times. Take a deep breath. Raise your shoulders up to your ears. Hold it. And let them drop. And one more time. Raise your shoulders up to your ears. Hold it. And let them drop. Oh. And just let that weight and tension drain off. And now we're going to do a few quick shoulder rolls, which kind of naturally follow from raising your shoulders and just circling your shoulders back and remembering to breathe. So you're breathing and exhaling. And then switch directions. And then as you're rolling, just let that roll down your arms and shake out your hands. It's really important to shake out your hands if you've been typing all day long for 10 hours getting that ceremony done. So shake out your hands. You can make sounds. You can do weird things because nobody can see you in your office when you're writing ceremonies. <laughs> You can do all, yes, yes, you can dance, all right, you can shake your legs, you can wiggle and squiggle. And one thing, because your spine is so important as you're sitting there all day long, and that's to give yourself a little twist. And I want that twist to originate from your tailbone. And at the very last thing that turns is your neck, so that you don't strain your neck. And you can hold the back of your chair if it helps, and then twist the other way. And so you have this whole series here. That was just a little teeny tidbitty taste. So thank you, Sasha and Cindy. And I want to end today by acknowledging the importance of our community as one of the most important things that we can do to take care of ourselves, and that's to stay connected to each other. And the Celebrant Foundation provides us with reams of ways to do that. And so I want you to remember this important con connection in your work. So come to the well to share your suffering, your struggles, and your self-doubts. And let us celebrate together moments of connection, joy, and healing. I want to end today by inviting up Kareen and Tomas to come forward and share with us this passage from the couple's Dao De Jing by Lao Tzu. Your love is a great mystery. It is like an eternal lake whose waters are always still and clear like glass. Looking into it, you can see the truth about your life. It is like a deep well whose waters are cool and pure. Drinking from it, you can be reborn. You do not have to steer the waters, nor dig the well. Merely see yourself clearly and drink deeply.
You can't just leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deb. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. What a wonderful way to end our day today. And especially, I love that Karine and Tomas came up. Karine from France all the way here. Tomas from Mexico. It is truly our, our international celebrant community that we've created. I want to thank you all for coming today. Celebrants new, celebrants experienced, our special invited guests. We have people who are here who are interested in the program. Please find me if you have more questions. And. Am I being photographed? Is that, <laughs> is that why I have to look over here? And I want to end today by bringing us back to the whales, who really represent the timeless collective wisdom of the oceans, the memory of time. And that is what we are creating each year with our collective wisdom conferences. Thank you very much.